Thank you. Let me jump first to the uh, to our participants. I'd like to also hear uh, some points of view. I think uh, Mr. Salazar has uh, raised his hand. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, uh, for the last three years, I, I go to China uh, for a forum on uh, 10 plus 3 media. That's the uh, 10 uh, media practitioners from ASEAN, the 10 ASEAN countries, one from Japan, uh, Korea, and then China. Last uh, September was the uh, most interesting of the forum because uh, what dominated our discussions was actually the territorial disputes. But this was not just China and the Philippines, China and Vietnam, China, Japan. But also among the ASEAN, there were also territorial disputes. But what I remember very clearly was during the discussion, by the way, the ones who attended were the president of People's Daily, and we had the, uh, then we went to Beijing for meetings with the Minister for Information in the Great Hall of the People. But one of the things they said was, we have to make sure, we have to make sure that we do not give space to the ultra-nationalists. This was said by the, uh, the, the uh, leaders from the People's Daily and the others. So I, I, I mentioned that because uh, I know what uh, Chito said earlier about the ultra national. I mean, they're aware that there are ultra-nationalist groups. And there seems to be this, this difficulty or, or challenge in, in China. Uh, who's going to dominate? And that's why the leadership issue is very important. But it, for us in ASEAN, we came out with the realization also that in each of our countries, there are also ultra-nationalists. There are people who want to go to war, uh, not realizing that what do we have to be able to get to war. So the second point I wanted to stress was in, in the resolution of this, when you try to bring in the big powers, you bring in you know, China. That's a reality that China is there. But you are the United States. And if you want to bring the United States into the picture, the question arises, why should you bring the United States into the picture? Why can this not be resolved using the ASEAN approach? Because once you bring another power into the picture, then you change the whole configuration. It becomes an issue between the United States and, and China. But if you use ASEAN, I think we'll have a better uh, way out here than to bring in the other uh, powers. These are just uh, uh, the two observations I'd like to make. But I'd like to also ask Chito to react to the first one on the ultra nationalist. Chito. Uh, was the publisher of the Global Times there? Too? Also, yes. He is. The <laughs> he represents the ultra nationalist no in no China. But uh, it, they, they, it is an open secret in China that uh, it's no longer a monolith. As I say, they have to rule by consensus. So they have to deal with the party, the government, the different factions, including the ultra nationalists. And, and that's why it's not so easy to interpret Chinese media. Because you read the Global Times and you think, oh, this is the government position. It is not. It is a policy option being promoted by the hardliners. And so the question usually is, what do you read then? And who do you, who do you believe? Uh, because the foreign ministry, well, China speaks in different voices. This is the problem. The foreign ministry now is being considered as a weak need institution that is not capable of defending China's sovereignty. So it, it's, it's being criticized in the social network, by the Global Times. Uh, so there is this problem, but it still represents the official position. Because the official position is really a compromise of different factions. And when I say the, the, the message of the 18th Party Congress, I am really quoting the political report which is the result of, again, a consensus of the different factions. That's why they speak with, it's like on both sides of their mouth. One they say peaceful development, on the other they said that we will remain firm, we will have a military buildup, and, and that's why it's hard to, it really will depend on the factional balance, on what they stress. And you will notice, as we went through last year in April, China was swinging in different directions, and. For a moment, I thought they would go for a 
quick, decisive strike to teach us a lesson because they were very strong cries to do that to the Philippines. But then the moderates or the dubs prevailed. They realized the political cost and most of all, that if they do that, then again you confront the other, the dominant power. And as I said, there are two things the Chinese recognize. One is the balance of power and they recognize a good business deal. So you really have to combine how to determine this to, to be able to deal with them. And, and that's, that's basically my reaction to that. Okay, thank you, very good insights. Uh, Mr. Paterno, Senator Paterno. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, I've been listening to what, three centuries of developments on uh, cooperation in the South China Sea. I want to tell you that I come from that other side. I cannot, I cannot um, escape the belief that as the years pass, ASEAN must become increasingly the most important organization in our foreign relations program. Um, so I propose that the Philippines, with all the former ASEAN 6, and where to the ASEAN 6 later, assess the stability, assess the viability of the present makeup of ASEAN and how to recover a more credible and important voice in world affairs. Forgive me if I refer back to the ASEAN of 1976. I was one of two ASEAN economic ministers. I was actually ASEAN industrial economic minister. And I worked very hard with uh, ministers Vijoyo and Rajiv Prawiro of Indonesia to develop the ASEAN Bali, the ASEAN Economic Cooperative of Bali, 1976. Um, we enjoyed, I enjoyed, internal report and international support working closely in particular with Indonesia's ASEAN Economic Ministers, Radius Prawiro and Ujoyo in this afternoon. To evolve the nucleus of the Treaty of Economic Cooperation, which was signed by the five heads of government and state in Bali from June 1976. ASEAN in 1976 was composed of only five nations. Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, and Thailand. We were small countries, but we commanded respect. And I remember the economic minister of the United States, you know, trying to talk to me about South South cooperation and how it was destined to fail. And I'm sure that there are conversations going on of the Chinese ministers telling Somali na lang sa amin, stop trying to be on your own. You're small potatoes. I was no longer as an economic minister in 1979 because I was signed out of that post. But as a private person, when we left government in November 1980, I personally questioned the wisdom of accepting the four in the, I mean, Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, and Vietnam 
as full economic partners in the ASEAN 6. And I recall how the European, European organization treated the entry of the countries of Eastern Europe. Prove yourself first. We did not ask these to prove themselves. They were accepted as full and equal partners. But you know, we're accepting as full and equal partners Laos and Cambodia with six, six and a half million people. And an economy that depends on larger economies. We cannot expect Laos and Cambodia to stand up for our rights without even recognizing what the rights really are. I question the wisdom of accepting the four as full partners in the association. And as I said, I would rather follow a vetting acceptance procedure. If the criteria for full partnership had been first set up and applied in the ASEAN 6, we could have accepted Vietnam first, Myanmar next, and until now left Laos and Cambodia under <coughs> provision. Accepting the joining us junior partners with voice but not the right to vote. And these are the guys who are messing up our situation. And I don't think the Philippine government should accept a situation like this. But it can do something to make ASEAN more viable, more credible, more respected economic cooperation union. Uh, so, let me make a proposal to, for ASEAN, for the ASEAN 6, original 6, to seriously consider downgrading Laos and Cambodia to junior partners with voice but no vote until they prove that they have a right and sovereignty to vote. We can accept the vote of somebody who's accepting the dictator of somebody else. So we need to set the appropriate criteria of size, economic capability, and real sovereignty to be established by ASEAN 6 plus Vietnam and Myanmar. I'm willing to concede now that both Vietnam and Myanmar, after their uh, <coughs> their what do you call it, normalization, uh, already served the as full partners. But I will continue to say that I will not be judged by my inferiors <laughs> or by an organization which does not have full sovereignty as a partner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Kapen. Very important. I think, well, we've captured that, so we should definitely go into the uh, the next uh, the next forum. Unfortunately, we're already approaching 6:30. I think I will just take one more uh, comment, and I hope you can be uh, the most dramatic and uh, <laughs> climactic, sir. Yes, uh, good evening. Uh, so it's just a on the Senate Economic Planning Office. 
I'd like to take uh, to uh, ask the personal take or view of our discussions. Uh, first, regarding the uh, uh, recent uh, action of China to issue Chinese passports with a dash line in there. Should the Philippines do the same in terms of the presentation made by Attorney Pinsurto of indicating the Philippines with its uh, uh, lines uh, in that uh, map? Uh, secondly, in terms of the question on uh, how, who do we talk to, uh, the issue on back channeling, or your view on it. And the third one, how long would the International Tribunal UNCLOS come up with a decision to dissolve the disputes? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So our panel of discussions will have the last say. Uh, who would like to talk about the passport issue? The passport. Uh, I guess Henry will have a lot to, <laughs> to answer here. Uh, I think on the passport issue, more or less, uh, this is that done. done in the sense that we have already done what we have to do, uh, and we have already announced what we have to do. Now, if your question is, uh, what is the rationale behind our actions? Uh, two things, uh, essentially. Uh, because this is a new development, stamping the 9 dash line. And uh, I think, you know, uh, remember two principles. Uh, and uh, we keep hearing this 100 years, right? Uh, there's a long. If you don't protest this, okay, legally, legally, one can argue later on. And this can be argued not necessarily today, but 20 years from now, when you and myself are gone, right? And 20 years from now, you can anticipate. Look, we have been issuing passports with the 9-9, and we have been stamping official visa on this. Isn't that an evidence of acquiescence? You see, I mentioned acquiescence, and there was a mention about, about legalities. One concept of actually acquiring ownership over a certain territory is what we refer to, and it was mentioned effectivity, right? And uh, effectivity means effective jurisdiction. You must be able to demonstrate. And if it is also a claim for historical, an important element, and I think Chito did say this earlier, a claim is not a title. For a claim to mature into a title, you have to satisfy certain criteria of international law. One criterion of international law is acquiescence. What is acquiescence? Acquiescence is you agree, right? Uh, so if ever you have that, it can actually be uh, argued that this is an evidence of acquiescence. Now, what we're trying to do now, in the past, we have been very liberal on this, but as we have seen and learning from our lessons, we have to show that uh, uh, expression of our disagreement in a friendly way, actually. A friendly way, why? Right? Because we're not prohibiting any country from issuing what color of its passport. We're not saying that. It's not for us to dictate on how other countries will uh, manufacture their own passwords. However, as it impacts on us, that's a different matter. So it is that which we are reacting to. It is not that we are dictating on it. Uh, so I have to make that distinction. And therefore, it is very important for us to do this, all right? Not, not for anything else, but for, for to, to make clear our position on the night dash uh, after. Uh, what is your other question, sir? Should, should we print the Philippines with the thing? It's not, it's not necessary, sir. It's not necessary. Uh, there's a difference between their claim. Uh, what we have said is what is ours is ours. We're not going beyond what is ours. I, 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 by analogy again, I, I adhere to my wife's principle of whatever is uh, mine is hers, whatever is hers is hers. That's okay. <laughs> but in this type of relationship, I think it must be clear. What is yours is yours. What is mine is mine. Mine cannot be yours. All right? So I don't want to use the, the wife's uh, uh, draconian measure in this relationship. And so that has to be clear. Uh, uh, so, that being the case, therefore, I don't see any necessity for us to print uh, our anything on that. I mean, we are also reasonable people. We don't do this to spite anybody. We do this as a matter of necessity. It is not our intention to spite anyone, it, but it is our intention to make 
our position is in a friendly way. Uh, that, that is, and you have a last point, sir? He was asking who, who to talk to. I mean, uh, well, just the whole idea of the back channeling. Uh, uh, and maybe, I don't know, maybe Chico has an idea also. Who. <laughs> <laughs> let me sorry, let me put it this way. Uh, I think when you engage, uh, you have to be imaginative. That's a given in any situation. But in the case of diplomacy, I think certain modalities outside of the box can be helpful or, un or unhelpful, depending on how it is managed. Obviously, a back channel will be helpful if it is consistent with the format. Because, let me put it this way. Sir, would you actually believe me? We're negotiating. Would you actually believe me if somebody else is doing the talk and representing? I'm not going to have any credibility. Right? I think that's common sense. But having said that, back channel is actually an imaginative way if done correctly. Uh, so it is, it is a modality that we have to be open-minded about. Uh, but at the same time, we don't want a lost man. By saying this, I'm not picking any fight with anybody, sir. I, I'm just I'm limiting my, my, my explanation and the position of principle. Having said that, I think Ambassador Villaporta would be in a position to explain a little further. <laughs> I think you had one, just one question about Bunclos. Yes. Uh, all right. If you're going to take a cursory examination of the various cases decided, the typical, the typical uh, gestation period, uh, actually, most of these cases have been resolved uh, at the average of uh, two to three years. Some four. There's one case that took ten years, but it's an exception. So, uh, so that's that's what it is. Now, it depends on the nature and the character of the issue that we will present. Obviously, if it's a territorial question, that's going to be a more difficult question. However, if it is a maritime question, uh, judging by how uh, various tribunals have decided on the case, that's the average after uh, that we're looking at. Now, having said that, uh, in the case of the Philippines, and I think. Uh, Secretary Aluna did allude to this earlier in terms of the totality of the approach. Uh, in the case of the Philippines, you have, uh, time and again, the, the Secretary has explained that we're take, taking a total approach on this. All options are on the table. By that, we're speaking, specifically saying about diplomatic and political trap. We also have the, the legal trap, uh, and we have the, the ASEAN trap. So all of these actually are not, this is not a zero-sum game. They're not mutually exclusive with each other. On the other hand, they are so interrelated with each other, uh, actually. So, so we have to be able to harness and be able to operate uh, and utilize a mix of all these options, uh, actually, and not limit ourselves to one or two, because by doing that, you are, in effect, constricting your flexibility and ability to adjust to the situation. So you have to be like a fax, actually, in terms of how to approach this. Okay, thank you. Now, as Porky Pig says, that's all, folks, <laughs> but for now. So um, I need to, I should emphasize that this is not the end, this is the beginning. So what we're doing is uh, basically emphasizing the paramount importance of this issue. Not just to the military, not just to DFA, not just to the embassies or people who have a special interest, but really to the citizen and the citizens not just of the Philippines, but the citizens of the region, of the community that this is something that is worth understanding more, and I think we're, we're still at that stage, we're trying to understand, learn, and then constructively engage to lead to a satisfying solution. Uh, I think that's, in the Senate they were talking about something else that was satisfying, but uh, in this case, a satisfying solution that will satisfy everyone, a win-win solution. Um, this forum, so this forum will go on. Uh, we may, the partners may change, or the partners may even, you know, uh, increase in number, uh, especially as we generate more interest. But the issues might 
become more narrow. We might now start focusing on specific areas. And I'm very happy that uh, that Henry could join the our panel. The you know uh, although lately, but uh, very very educational for me. And uh, well, before I I end, I don't know if the the good dean uh, would like to say anything else. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, Please, there are uh, there are there's still coffee and, and biscuits outside, and uh, please don't rush off. No? Uh, exchange cards and shake hands, but please don't step on anybody's foot while you're shaking hands. No? Now, to the uh, the distinguished discussants, our panelists, thank you so much. Uh, as Henry pointed out, all our discussants are being a bit too humble. I, I mean, we you know. We, we know uh, how important uh, they are, not just that they were, but they are, and how important their opinions count. So thank you so much, uh, Senator Shahani, Secretary Alunan, Chito Santa Romana, and Henry. Thank you so much for being with us. And then uh, thank you, of course, to, well, on, my, on behalf of the Harvard uh, Kennedy alumni, thank you to our hosts. AIM, the Asian Institute of Management, both the Center for Development Management and uh, the uh, Policy Center. And of course our partners now for the long term, Asia Society and the foreign, uh, sorry, the former uh, senior government officials. Um, I still have my, my application as a former senior government official still pending with uh, with Paula, but I hope I've proven that I am worthy of joining the group. So thank you very much uh, again to everyone, to all the participants. Thank you for being with us, and we'll see you again.